Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this session is Complex PCI Master Class 4 Calcification. I'm Ju Yong Han from Samsung Medical Center, Seoul, Korea, and my co chair is Dr. Snow Nakamura. Uh, we have four uh, topics, and uh, I will introduce the first two speakers, and Dr. Nakamura will introduce the last two speakers. The first speaker will be Dr. Do Yun Gang from Asan Medical Center, and his topic is Practical Approach to the Calcified Legion PCI. Dr. Gang, please. Thank you, Dr. Han. I am Dr. Gang from Asan Medical Center. Uh, I will talk about the practical approach to the calcified legion PCI uh, that I will show my practice itself and the, uh, the following three uh, masters and master speakers will show the details of the atherectomy devices and imaging and other details. I have nothing to disclose. The correct calcification is very important for PCI. Why? Calcium is a marker of the extent of coronary atherosclerosis, and it shows the underlying patient condition. And calcification results in suboptimal stent result. It impaired stent delivery, decreased stent expansion, malopposition, asymmetry, and other complications like dissection, perforations happens in severely calcified regions. And the prevalence of the calcium by angiographic severity was about 11% of the patient in IRSDS registry and the, the, about 4.4% 4, 4, 4 of the regions in the, the numbers of the region. And about 10% of the regions showed moderate to severe angiographic calcium in IRSDS registry. And those patients with a moderate to severe calcification showed significantly higher type of vessel failure and that's where my cardiac infarction rate. The calcium is the final enemy for interventionist. This is the European guideline that shows the, the some guideline to select PCI versus cabbage and anatomical and technical aspect, severe calcific lesion, limiting lesion expansion is the key consideration for selecting cabbage. Then how can we detect calcium? There is some discrepancy between IVUS and OCT defined calcium and angiographic calcium. This is data from the US that showed in some patient with a non-angiographic calcification, patient also sh or even showed the severe or the lean calcification in IVUS or OCT. This kind of the, the thin the superficial calcification is usually not visible in angiography. So in the patient that the calcification region is suspected or shown in CT or expected, then always we must prepare for the worst situation. Warning for the patient and use of the strong guiding cutter and guide extension cutter if needed and preparation of the atherectomy devices on in this kind of the patient would be needed. First, guided extension catheter enables the complex procedure in calcified and tortuous patient. We have now three telescope guidelines in guideline Korea. And this kind of the, the balloon, uh, balloon guided tracking of the guided extension catheter enables the stand or device delivery in very calcified regions. And it also enables the, this kind of the very calcified region PCI and sometimes it enables the low tabulation in the distal region uh, via the guide extension cutter. This is a seven French guide gilla and applied with a 1.25 millimeter bar. And the key message for the PCI for heavily calcified region is the region preparation always. Region preparation, region preparation. Do not stand on poorly prepared calcification we must always remember. And always the see and the check the, the balloon inflation before stenting. You can clearly see now with the stand you know, visualization method like stand clear or stand boost. If you check the, the balloon and angio, then on the expanded balloon or stand is well shown. Also in IVUS or OCT, you can detect on the expanded calcium or stand. And if it, once the stent is placed, an expansion of those on the expanded stent is very difficult. 
And sometimes you need the stent ablation. So never put the stent before optimal lesion preparation. This is my key message. This is the patient with a 65-year-old male patient with diabetes and 2.55 compliant volume and there was some severe calcification and the cutting balloon was applied. But still, there is some indentation of the balloon, but not well detected, and stent was placed. Stent should not be implanted. But after that, you can see the indentation of the stent in angiography, and in IVUS, the stent expansion, the under expansion was more severe. And stent does not expand with the 3.5 and 3.75 NC balloons at sorry ATM. Finally, it was expanded with the 4.0 very large balloon at 34 ATM. You can see the moment that the, the stent is expanded. This is very diff, very dangerous situation. So you must avoid this kind of situation. Must predilate, must check the full dilation of the balloon and breakage of the calcium and then put the stent. And to approach the calcium lesion, we can use the many weapons, high pressure balloon, and just cover cutting balloons, rotational atherectomy, orbital atherectomy, intravascular lithotripsy, laser atherectomy. In Korea, the only rotational atherectomy device is available yet. And we can use rotational atherectomy when the balloon or IVUS catheter failure to pass an undilatable region, and the region with a high amount of the calcium. And in intravascular imaging, you can see the angle and thickness of the calcium. Uh, this is a case with a 66-year-old male with the effort angina. And there's some ISR. IS RCA also shows severely calcified region with heavy calcium nodules. Wiring with a Geisler backup and introduce the cosel. And then performed the pre-balloon with the 1.0 and 2.0 and did not expand. Check the IVUS and the after balloon and the, there was a diffuse multiple heavy calcified nodule at the region. So we performed the rotea with a 1.5 millimeter bar. This is a very torturous region, so the, the Michael Lee will show that the, the troubleshooting in this case. Yeah, I will go by, yeah. And then after then post tabulation there was some debarking, but there was still the heavily calcified nodule. But after that, NC balloon did work, and we could do the stenting with the Geisler support. And then performed high pressure post dilation balloon with a 4.0, and this is the final angiography. Still, there would be some under expansion and mild opposition. And then, in this kind of patient, we must. Uh, prescribe the stronger medication and check the patient's symptom regularly would be needed. And we have another new option because the atherectomy device uh, cannot be used in some very high risk population easily in the patient with the heart failure or the, the, the risk of the no, no for phenomenon. And then in those kind of patients, we have the new option with the super high pressure balloon. This is a 70 year old man with a fault angina with a calcific disease. And the LAD showed severe calcification. And we predilated with many NC balloons and did not work. Finally, with a 2.75 at 34 ATM, finally it was opened. This kind of the super high pressure balloon enables the, the NC ballooning without atherectomy devices. And we could check the balloon induced breakage in the IVOS image. And then perform the PCI with the Geisel backup. And finally, I've showed well opposed tent with a 6.8 square millimeter and mid LAD. So, in this kind of procedure, the intravascular imaging is very important to see the, the, the fate of the calcium and the morphology of the calcium and check the vessel size to select the the safety, safety margin of the balloon and stent size. And angiography cannot uh, clearly demonstrate the calcium thickness or calcium length. And IVUS and OCT, especially the OCT, is better if it can cross the region to, to clarify, uh, clearly visualize the calcium. 
And there is some calcium scoring system was also the, uh, presented by the, the CRF group. And they uh, insisted that in case of the high calcium score, rotation, some astrectomy device would be helpful. And uh, some random trial on based of the, this uh, concept is ongoing. And the important thing during the daily practice for intravascular imaging, I think the first is to check the calcium breakage after predilation. You must check the breakage of the calcium. And if it is not opened well, you must do the more aggressive region preparation with the NC balloons and acetomy devices. Do not put the stent. And then check the vessel size. There is some under expansion and marrow position, but if we implant bigger stent or balloon, it can make perforation. Perfection would be the enemy of a good. In the severely calcified region patient, perfection can be harmful for the patient. And also final IV surveillance enables the, the clearly shows the result, acute result of the PCI, then it is the, the most benefit thing of the intravascular imaging. And this is my personal practical approach to calcified region. In severely calcified region on angiography or CT, use the, the intracoronary imaging. And if the balloon or intravascular imaging passes, then perform image guided pre region modification with balloons. If it does not, cross with the microcatheter or direct wiring and perform atherectomy. Then perform pre region modification. Then check the appropriate expansion with the angiography, with the enhanced stand visualization system and intravascular imaging. If it does not happen, consider perform additional atherectomy. If it is done, then perform stenting with imaging guidance, and then perform stent optimization with the NC balloon or super high pressure balloon, and the final imaging surveillance will guarantee the long-term clinical, better long-term clinical outcome. So this is my summary. Always prepare for the worst situation. Never underestimate the calcium. And intracranial imaging is helpful to plan the strategy, guide the procedure, and finalize the result. Prepare the region before stenting, and please take care of the post stent optimization also. And always, safety is the first. Do not oversize too much. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. The next speaker, Professor Akasaka. So the title will be the uh, role of imaging in the calcium region treatment. So, Professor Akasaka, please. Thank you, Dr. Nakamura, for kind introduction. Today's my talk is role of imaging for a calcified region. This is my disclosure slide. Uh, as you know, and also as Dr. Khan already said, why coronary calcium is so important because patients with severe calcification had significantly worse outcome compared to those without. Uh, as shown in this slide, in case with severe calcification, TVF, uh, cardiac death, uh, MRI, and TVR is significantly higher. And the right hand side, severe calcification demonstrates higher MACE and TVR and the MI compared with the remaining. The, uh, the reason why the, the poor prognosis, one of the cause might be the polymer damage uh, during uh, the stand uh, cross, the calcified region as shown in this slide. And also, Severe thick calcium more than 180 degree may cause the stent under expansion as shown in the, in the bottom of this slide. There are uh, several image modality to identify calcium and uh, IBUS is, uh, should be a very sensitive. However, OCT can evaluate the thickness of calcium as Dr. Khan already explained. And this is a comparison between OCT and IBUS and there are several advantages and disadvantages in the uh, intravascular imaging. However, in case with a severe calcification, OCT might have some advantage as already said. And uh, compared with an uh, OCT, IBUS is much sensitive to identify the calcium because the, the penetration depth is high and uh, the IBUS can identify the deeper calcium compared with OCT. However, as I told you, OCT can measure the thickness of calcium in detail. 
So if you think about the advantage and disadvantage of OCT and IBUS, dual sensor system may be ideal to overcome the both uh, the image limitation. This is a steel frame and using dual sensor image with OCT and IBUS, not only identification of the calcium, with accurate measurement of its thickness, but also the differentiation among attenuation plug by IBUS could be easily by OCT as shown in this slide. So let's start the, the case presentation. Uh, the patients are referred to uh, uh, interventionist uh, for uh, evaluation of the effort AP before a colon cancer operation. You can identify the severe calcification because of a heavily calcified region. It was difficult to pass any PCI devices and imaging modality through the MRA site and rotabulator was performed as shown in the right hand side. And this is an uh, OCT image after a one 0.5 millimeter bar abrasion, and still there are circular calcium. Therefore, we bar size up to two millimeter, and we can make an ablation. And we did a uh, drug coated balloon uh, because the patient have to do the operation. Uh, this is a 70 years old male uh, hemodialysis patient after CABG. You can identify the calcium from the proximal to the distal portion with tight region at the, the mid portion of the right. Uh, Coronary uh, IBUS demonstrate heavily calcified region, but we cannot identify the thickness of the calcium by IBUS. But OCT can clearly demonstrate almost circular calcium around uh, the, uh, the, uh, from distal to the, the proximal site. And then this is steel frame, calcified nodule and circular calcium in the mid and uh, proximal site. And after a uh, rotabulator, we can identify the ablation site. And uh, it is very important to make a uh, 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 fracture, as Dr. Khan already said. And if the thickness of the uh, calcium is less than 500 micron, you can make a uh, fracture by using a, a high pressure non compliant balloon, cutting balloon, or a squaring balloon. And if you succeed to make a fracture, you can get a good stent expansion as shown in this slide. And this is our data. If there are calcium fracture, minimum stent area is significantly greater and also the stent expansion is better compared with uh, the case uh, no fracture. And also the binary listenos and TLR is significantly lower in case with calcium fracture compared with no calcium fracture. And uh, the uh, yeah, cutoff value for making a, a fracture uh, might be around 500 micron based on this analysis. And this is another data showing the, uh, the making a crack uh, by a scoring balloon. Around uh, 500 micron is a cutoff value to make a fracture based on uh, this data. And case three demonstrate uh, uh, the history of prior intervention effort angina. And this uh, is a little bit simple, uh, uh, the LAD mid region. However, you can identify uh, the calcium just at the, the bifurcation site uh, between LAD and diagonal branch. And this is a steel frame of OCT. You can identify very thick eccentric calcium more than one millimeter. If you simply put the stent here, the carina may shift to the, the diagonal branch and may pinch the, uh, the diagonal branch, may have a complication. Therefore, we try to uh, yes, uh, did uh, the orbit atherectomy using a wire bias during pullback way, and uh, we check the, the uh, low speed, uh, the, the result of orbit, and then did a high e e speed for four times and making uh, uh, le uh, thickness uh, less than uh, 500 micron, as shown in this slide. And after uh, uh, using a high pressure balloon, we succeed to make a fracture and uh, easily to put a uh, stent expansion without any complication, as shown in, in the right hand side. The case for is non STEMI after uh, CABG. And, uh, Angiography demonstrates very tight stenosis and with calcium at the distal left main to the, the proximal site of LCX and LAD. And this is an, another view. You can identify the severe calcium and tight region, 99% uh, uh, delayed uh, flow, right? Okay. And if you simply do the, the uh, rotablator, there are a risk of uh, 
perforation as shown in this slide, uh, two type of uh, perforation. Therefore, uh, we try to do the uh, orbital atelectomy uh, after low speed and then high speed. Uh, this is a high speed uh, 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 orbital atelectomy is imaging. You can identify some aberration. And this is a steel frame, uh, low speed. We, we can confirm the aberration of the uh, calcium, and then high speed, we succeed to make a route for our rotabulator. Then we did an a rotabulator as shown in this uh, movie, right? And then uh, we succeed to make a uh, good aberration. And this is uh, the image after rotabulator. You can identify the uh, big aberration in, in the uh, proximal LCX and also the, uh, the bifurcation and then uh, the left main. And we did a uh, drug coated balloon uh, inflation because still there are a lot of calcium and it might be very difficult to make a clock using a bigger balloon in this case. But now if you have a uh, shock wave, you can make a clock, I think. And recently we have a shock wave and you can uh, make a clock much more easily. This is an uh, approval trial, more than 50%. You can make a clock by using a shock wave. But uh, if the calcium is very limited, it might be difficult to make a clock. And as already is said uh, by Dr. Khan, uh, there are a scoring system based on the calcium angle, thickness, and length, and uh, uh, the point is uh, from zero to four. And if the uh, point is four, you have to make uh, some aberration to uh, region preparation. The balloon crossability is very important. There are several recommendations. If the balloon crossable after pre-dilatation in the calcium, you can mm, decide the, the uh, condition, uh, scoring the, the calcium. And if it is uh, less than three, you can make a uh, region preparation by a non-component balloon or cutting scoring balloon as shown in this slide. If the score is very high, you can do the, the uh, atelectomy as shown in this slide. If uh, there are uh, no crossability of the, the, uh, the balloon or imaging, uh, it is important to do the is aberration first and then try to do the imaging. And then, anyway, it is important to get an optimal balloon expansion. If it is not enough, you try to do the shock wave and then finally you can put a stand. The problem is the calcified nodule compared with non calcified uh, nodule, calcified nodule demonstrate poor prognosis as shown in this slide. Even if you do the aberration, calcified nodule uh, is uh, uh, still the problem and uh, there are no significant difference if you use an aberration or not. This will be uh, talked by Giazo uh, Ali later, I think. And this is my uh, take home message to you. A region modification by a telectomy would be recommended if any imaging device could not be passed through the tight region with severe calcification, step by step approach by changing in bar size and or a rotabulator speed. Uh, I will be uh, recommended for operating calcium safely using wire bias under imaging guide. OCT may allow us to demonstrate clearly the, the position, distribution, and thickness of calcium, although IBUS might be more sensitive to detect the calcium than IBUS. Confirmation of calcium plate fracture by imaging modality after high pressure ballooning with non compliant scoring or cutting balloon should be uh, mandatory if the, the thickness of it becomes less than uh, 500 micron to obtain a good stent expansion. Enough stent expansion and less instant resistance could be expected if you succeed to make a calcium fracture after high pressure ballooning or uh, IVL uh, shock wave. The calcified nodule demonstrated poor prognosis compared with non calcified nodule even after aberration under the guidance of intracoronary imaging. That is a problem. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Akasakase. Next speaker will be Professor Michael Lee, the great friend of us. He always gave us a very great lecture. The today lecture title is Rotation Selective in the Trouble Shooting. The brief. Thank you. And it's good to see everybody again. It's been three years since I was last here, and I'd like to congratulate the uh, uh, the study or the uh, course directors and Dr. Duckwood Park and S.J. Park. It's always humbling to be here. 
As Dr. Kang outlined and highlighted the importance of identifying the presence of severe calcium, failure to identify this could be deadly. I wanted to share with you a case where one of my colleagues performed a PCI on an 80-year-old male, had diabetes, presumed with ACS. You can see there's severe proximal calcification, and on first perusal, it looks like it's a fairly easy procedure to do with atherectomy. However, um, this operator decided to try balloon angioplasty initially. Uh, the balloon did not yield. You can still see a balloon that completely has not profiled. After multiple prolonged high-pressure inflations, you could see that there's some staining here consistent with the dissection. Also, flow down the LAD was perturbed. This led to uh, ischemia, and this patient had a uh, cardiac arrest, was uh, resuscitated after CPR, which was prolonged. After a mechanical circulatory support device was implanted, rotation atherectomy was performed. The final angiographic result was good. However, as with many cases like this, the patient goes to the ICU, has a prolonged course, hemometabolic shock, multi-organ failure, and subsequently uh, passed away. So for the next eight minutes or so, I wanted to share with you the, maybe the 20 years experience I have with rotational atherectomy, some of my tricks and tips in terms of uh, getting out of certain situations. So whenever you make, let's say, multiple Burr exchanges, there's times where you actually lose wire position. This is an 86-year-old female with multiple comorbidities, uh, in particular had an ejection fraction of 35%, was not considered a surgical candidate given her lung disease. You can see the extensive PAD. She had mesenteric ischemia, that is post-stenting. And you can look at the left main. There's left main disease. There's osteocirc disease. There's complex, severe, calcified LAD. So we have a eight French guy catheter in. You could see, again, distal bifurcation disease, complex LAD. So we decided to proceed with a, a, a two-cent approach. So because of the severity of the proximal LAD, we did not want to start with a 1-5. But whenever you make multiple passes, you can see here that the wire here, the radio pig portion, is in, let's say, the distal two-third, but then after exchanging out with the one five burr, you can see that the radio opaque portion of the rotofloppy wire has now come back proximally. So what do you do at this point? Do you take the whole system out? A simple technique that you can do is just go on Dynaglide, and under Dynaglide, you can actually push the wire forward. So with Dynaglide, you decrease friction, you're easily able to pass the wire forward. We then subsequently upgrade to a one seven five burr, Address the proximal LED with a 3528 EES. Then we address the distal left main with a crush technique. We put a, um, a 3515, uh, crush that with a 3515 balloon. We're placing the osteal left main stent in the iliocranial position. We do a pot, a flare of the ostium, final kissing, and here's your final angiographic result. So again, when the wire comes back, just tap by and Dynaglide, push the wire, and nine times out of 10, it'll work. Now, let's say you're performing a rotation atherectomy with, let's say, an assistant who does not have a lot of experience or familiarity. This is a technique, I think, which is very helpful in the setting where you have an inexperienced uh, assistant. This is what I consider the single operator technique. So you could place your, let's say, rotoblader right next to the guy catheter. Now, you create a loop with the shaft, and with your right hand, all you do is pull back the wire. At the same time, you're advancing the shaft with your left hand simultaneously. If the wire were to come back, uh, you want to pull back um, or let the, um, the catheter go forward. If the wire uh, goes too far, and you just pull the wire back. So you can do this. I think it took me about two to three times to kind of uh, get uh, facile with this technique, but maybe not try it when uh, you have a difficult case, but maybe try it on your own when it's not very complex. But, but this is a very useful technique to have uh, in your armamentarium when you have an assistant that's not very experienced with rotoblader. Now, what about a case where you take the burr up, and if you activate it, it's going to jump and potentially dissect the artery, because now you've got this burr into the uh, plaque. So there's three techniques that I do. Number one is just pull back the rotor wire. You take off a lot of slack, um, so that actually relieves a lot of the tension. Number two, 
just release the knob and just kind of jiggle it back and forth. That also takes off a lot of tension and slack. And last but not least, just go ahead and activate Dynaglide, as opposed to if you were to activate it at 150,000 RPMs with Dynaglide, which is 50,000 RPMs, it just maybe it will jump, but not as much. And again, takes out the slack, so very useful to do. What about slow flow? There's a couple of techniques uh, in pharmacotherapy that can be administered. Now, number one, when you're performing atherectomy, just have your assistant continuously inject saline. Some people like to give a puff of contrast. I don't like to do that. I've had times where the contrast was given during the procedure when we try to swap out and upgrade to a di different burr. Uh, it gets very uh, sticky and difficult to take out the uh, 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 rotation atherectomy burr. That required us putting a, a brand new wire in, so no contrast. <laughs> Number two, decrease the amount of passes in the duration. So if there is a large amount of plaque burden, maybe just limited to 10 seconds, allow the patient to recover. I think it's personally related to the amount of, of plaque that's uh, atherectomized that goes downstream, causes hemodynamic perturbations. Have a nurse ready with pharmacotherapy, which includes nipride. This is my preferred agent. I don't like to use adenosine because it can cause bradycardia. Nicardipine also works very well. And as well, if the patient has some hemodynamic collapse, IV phenylephrine 100 mics is very handy. Now, let's say you're unable to advance the bird to the lesion. So Dr. Kang showed us, let's say in a very torturous right, what can you do? As you would expect, go to Dynaglide. When you just tap on Dynaglide, it'll probably jump maybe about five centimeters, uh, then reset, push again. If it doesn't advance, there's a lot of stored force. Tap on Dynaglide again, or, uh, go forward. So just keep repeating this, and once you make that turn, it's very helpful. Dynaglide at, uh, uh, let's say, 50,000 RPMs is not gonna do anything catastrophic to the arteries, so. <clears throat> all right, this is the dreaded fear of burr entrapment. What should we do? First of all, why does this happen? Well, if you look at the burr, number one, the diamond crystals are only at the distal one half of the burr. And so when you go antigrade, it may work, but when you try to come back pr proximal retrograde because there's no uh, crystals here, that's where you get stuck. Number two, it's more common with one, two, five burrs. I uncommonly use one, two, five burrs. So it happens in about 0.5 to 1%. The easiest thing to do is just get another wire and try to advance a low profile balloon if it works. This commonly does not work. This is an example of a a case where the um, burr could not be pulled back retrograde, so you pass another wire, do a balloon inflation, that may just alter the geometry, the plaque morphology, and allow you to come back retrograde. I think a very elegant technique that one should have um, in their uh, arsenal to treat this is the following. Number one, if you get stuck, Get a big scissor. I'm talking about a big surgical scissor, which has a lot of uh, power, uh, not one of those small scissors which is used to cut a suture. And the reason why is because if you don't make a clean cut, you could fray the proximal end. So cut it very close to the black rubber connector. Okay, that's number one. Number two, just pull back that plastic uh, drive shaft sheath and expose it. Now you're down only to the drive shaft of the burr. Number three, just load your guide extension catheter, like a guide zilla or, um, or a guide liner, and it take it all the way down, have your assistant hold the wire. Now you're working with basically a monorail system. Advance forward all the way to the tip. Now, as opposed to, let's say, deep throat in the guide catheter, which is undesirable, you could take that guide uh, extension catheter all the way down to the tip where the burr is, sheath it, now you have it covered, and you could pull back together. Now, the one thing you're gonna do is lose wire position. If you lose wire position, so you have to be able to work quickly to do a contrast injection to make sure there's no complication like a dissection. If there's no dissection, you could take your time, advance your wire, et cetera. If there's a dissection, you have to work expeditiously. What about hypotension? A couple of thoughts. Most centers use what's called the uh, rotoglide um, solution, which has vasodilators, egg yolk, we don't use that because we've had oftentimes where patients get hypotensive. All we do is just get a bag of normal saline and just put in 1,000 units, uh, units of heparin, it works great. Number two, when you're gonna perform passes, 
I always have the nurse get 100 mics of phenylephrine IV because if the patient gets hypotensive and you need IV uh, phenylephrine emergently, it takes too long. The, the nurse has to go to the Pixis, withdraw it, mix it, uh, and give it, it's going to take at least a minute. So when I'm going to do the passes, I have the nurse ready with a syringe in hand, and what's the worst case scenario? She has to discard it. But this really works the best because you really need it when you need it. What about bradycardia? We use pacemakers very uh, infrequently. Times that we would use it is where they're, let's say, baseline bradycardic, uh, high 50s, low 60s. These patients are made MPO uh, after midnight, so oftentimes the beta blockers are held. Uh, but if the patient has, let's say, borderline bradycardia in the 60s, limited duration of passes, again, oftentimes it's related to the amount of debris that embolizes distally. So maybe just pass a couple of times, let them uh, recover, let the, the bradycardia or the hypotension recover. Once you get atherectomy and debulking, uh, at that point you can make your uh, final uh, polishing runs. And again, have the nurse have the atropine box ready. You don't have to uh, disc uh, or open up the box per se, but just have it ready because to go to the crash cart, have it open it and to deliver it, it just takes too long. So have the nurse on heightened alert. So in conclusion, burr entrapment is common. It's typically associated with the 125 burr. Avoid using that. Number two, which is called the Kokesi phenomena, just work very slowly, a pecking maneuver, as opposed to working very vigorously, so it just flies through and you can't retract. Uh, so take your time. Number three, consider using an alternative rotor glide. So let's say 10,000 units of IV heparin into a liter bag. Transvenous pacemaking is very uncommon, but have your nurse readily available with phenylephrine and atropine. So failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, the next speaker will be Dr. Jia Dali from St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center, USA. And this is a recorded presentation. Please start it. Hello, my name is Ziad Ali from St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. It's my pleasure to give you this lecture on calcified nodules, focusing on both eruptive and non-eruptive subtypes. These are my disclosures. Well, first of all, I'd like to start by saying that we don't know that much about calcified nodules. And what you're going to see in the next 10 minutes or so is really an accumulation of two years work, um, really taking a deep dive based on OCT as well as on clinical data. Essentially, calcified nodules can be summarized into eruptive calcified nodules, which are an accumulation of small fragments with irregular surface and adjacent proximal or distal deep sheet calcification. Nodular calcification or non-eruptive calcified nodules are calcium fragments with a smooth thick fibrous cap that have adjacent proximal or distal deep sheet calcification. And here you can show, see on the left side that these calcified nodules typically happen at bends in the artery and are surrounded by deep calcium. Now, let's focus on the two separate types of calcified nodules we'll be discussing. The first, an eruptive calcified nodule, you can see visually looks very different in that it has an irregular surface as well as surrounding calcium. On the contrary, a protruding nodule has surrounding calcium but has a very smooth surface. And I'm going to summarize these as looking like shards of glass that may be sticking out into the lumen and a marble that may be sticking into the lumen when a protruding nodule is present. Now, what we know about calcified nodules is that they occur at areas of large lipid burden. So they're focused around the proximal vessels. You'll notice that the vast majority of nodules are in the proximal and mid parts of the coronary arteries focused in the LAD and RCA. And the reason is these are typically large arteries which can hold large volumes of lipid. And ultimately those large volumes of lipid can turn into lipid core, necrotic core, leading to severe calcification. We also know that calcified nodules are located in areas of totional stretch, so you typically see them in the proximal to mid right coronary, the proximal to mid LED, as well as the proximal left circumflex. Now, calcified nodules happen at sense of bending in the artery, and the reason for this is because they start as calcific sheets. As these calcific sheets fracture, they become eruptive nodules, and as they heal, or further calcified, 
they become protruding nodules. So the rules of nodule are essentially that they occur in sites of severe calcium and they occur at sites of torsional stress. Now let's talk about the pathogenesis of an eruptive calcific nodule. We start off with a lipidic plaque. Over time, that lipidic plaque turns into a necrotic core, and as we move towards a necrotic core, that lipidic plaque transforms over time into calcified sheet. These calcified sheets, when at areas of the artery that can fracture, serving as a hinge point, actually lead to the breakage of the calcific sheet, which leads to shards of calcium, it's very much like shards of glass. And when these protrude into the lumen, they become thrombogenic and get a fibrin cap. And when they protrude into the vessel wall, they create an intraplaque hemorrhage. So to look at this from the inside, essentially what you see is these glass shards poking in from outside of the lumen. And you can see that inside there's a large lipid base that now has an, an intramural hemorrhage in it. And the way I describe this is a broken glass in a pillow. And the broken glass sticks out into the lumen. Now, because this is broken glass on a pillow, what you'll notice is that when you modify these by either balloon or stent, you can deform and push these shards into the wall, and ultimately the stent will push the shards out of the way. This is an example of an eruptive calcific nodule on histology. You can see that it's poked through the artery wall. You'll also notice that there's a thrombus cap on this, and this is because as these shards stick out into the lumen, they uh, gather fibrin and thrombus. Now, with regards to the pathogenesis of a protruding nodule, this also starts in lipidic plaque. The lipidic plaque over time turns into calcified sheet, but two possibilities occur from this point forward. One, that there is calcific progression with growth of the protruding nodule because there's an increase in the lipid burden, or that the lipid progresses by being pushed out by a lipid base because there's further progression of atherosclerosis. Now these behave very differently. Now when you see nodular calcium, you'll note that there's a either solid base or as I showed you before, a lipidic base. And unfortunately, it's very difficult for us to determine whether this is the case or not. And this is the problem. We cannot easily distinguish angiographically or by intravascular imaging if we have a calcific progression causing a large calcified nodule or if we have a calcified nodule with a lipidic base. The behavior, of course, is completely different. And if we look at this uh, from an intraluminal cross-section, you'll notice in this example where we have a calcific protruding nodule that's actually a lipidic base, when we actually push this calcium into the lipidic base, we're able to deform it and end up with good uh, stent expansion. Here, however, we have no lipidic base and actually the entire nodule is calcified with no lipid underneath it, in which case when we try to modify this, we cannot, and we lead to a suboptimal stent expansion and very poor symmetry. Unfortunately, intravascular imaging cannot help us determine a protruding calcified nodule that may be on a lipidic or calcific base, but it can help us differentiate a protruding nodule from an eruptive nodule, and as I mentioned to you earlier, eruptive nodules are almost uniformly deformable. So we know that eruptive calcified nodules are active. We know that protruding calcified nodules are passive. So how can you differentiate? Well, the main feature is actually the angiogram and the response of the balloon. You can see on the left, by angiogram, you can't tell what this is but this is either an eruptive or protruding deformable nodule, and on the right, we have a protruding non-deformable nodule. How do you learn this? You learn it with the behavior of the balloon. You can see on the left side, the balloon completely expands an NC, and on the right side, the protruding non-deformable nodule does not expand at all. So understanding the way that the balloon behaves on top of a nodule is really telltale as to how ultimately this balloon will be deformable or not. Now, these are the principles of treatment. When you use a semi-compliant balloon, the balloon will expand radially, but not actually modify the nodule at all and not push the nodule to help you determine whether it's a uh, calcium on rock or a calcium on lipid. So we need to use a non-compliant balloon. These are not semantics. 
And the reason is that calcified nodules with dis without disruption of the superficial intimal fibrous layer actually do very well. On the contrary, calcified nodules with disruption of the superficial intimal layer do very poorly, i.e. the eruptive nodules are particularly prone to re-emerging through the stent struts. In summary, almost 75% of nodules are deformable. The glass in the pillow and the marble in a pillow are deformable, but the marble on the rock is not. So how do we manage these? Now we use an algorithmic approach using angiographic assessment, isolating the nodule on angiogram, looking at intravascular imaging, understanding the balloon behavior, determining whether we can fracture and also deform the nodule, and finally seeing if we get a good result. What are the principles? We know that nodular calcium is heterogeneous in response, but they look the same but behave differently. We also aren't really sure what intravascular imaging has to offer in the protruding nodule other than helping us differentiate erupting from protruding. There are three different possibilities for treatment, orbital atherectomy, rotational atherectomy, or shockwave intravascular lithotripsy. Rotational atherectomy and calcified nodules basically ablates the nodule. It's the first choice for critical lesions and volume reduction. The larger the lumen, the more the wire bias, and really, you really need a big burr in order to be able to impact the nodule. Here's an example of a patient who has a 1.5 burr and a calcified nodule, and simply pre and post rota, there's no impact on the nodule at all because of the wire bias. And here you can see the reason for that inadequate vessel preparation is because the rotational atherectomy wire bias is away from the nodule. On the contrary, orbital atherectomy is also an ablative therapy, but has the ability to orbit into the nodule and thins the nodule with less dependence on wire bias. That same case that I just showed you, we ended up performing orbital atherectomy. What you'll notice comparing rotational to orbital atherectomy is that this was able to cut off the nodule and significantly debulk it compared to rotational atherectomy. Now the problem with protruding calcified nodules, particularly the marble on rock, is that even after we perform atherectomy, we may not really impact the calcium whatsoever. And as a result, this leads to poor stent expansion and poor stent symmetry. IBL is a non-ablative therapy. It works irrespective of wire bias, fractures superficial calcium, and it may actually fracture deep calcium, allowing the nodules to become more deformable. We know that we're more likely to have calcium nodules in more calcium, and we know that the more calcium you have, the more likely you are to have a calcium fracture. So looking at our earlier examples, when we have a calcified nodule such that has a lipid base, we may be able to fracture the nodule and push it into the wall, giving us an advantage. And actually, in the calcium on rock or the marble on rock, we may be able to fracture the calcium and actually break it into smaller pieces such that it can be manipulated uh, and deformable. Um, in that regard, IDL actually has the uh, greatest available data. Uh, this data from the Disrupt CED study shows that calcified nodules, uh, irrespective of the calcified nodule presence or absence, the minimal lumen area, minimal stent area, or mean stent area are all the same. And as a result, very encouraging early data. So in summary, calcified nodules are associated with adverse clinical outcomes. The calcium therapies are preferable, and really imaging helps mitigate the risk. A durable result can be obtained by a targeted algorithmic approach. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoy Complex PCI. I look forward to seeing you at TCT Asia Pacific. So now this session is open to discussion and question, and we have uh, six distinguished panels, Dr. Hiteshi Chauhan, Dr. Paul uh, Chun-Lim Cham, Dr. Cho Tech Erin Kong, Dr. Wei Chun Huang, Dr. Sang Yeb Lee, and Dr. Vincent Luke. Uh, Professor, can I ask the first question? I'm Wei Chun Huang from Taiwan. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can, okay, we can hear you. you. 
So please. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you for your uh, uh, for all your excellent talk. I have a question for the Michael Michael Lee uh, about the uh, entrenchment, uh, and I uh, I really uh, appreciate your talk, especially for the hypertension. Right in Taiwan, uh, usually we use uh, for the hypertension we use uh, no epinephrine for one hundred microgram can increase the patient the uh, blood pressure uh, very quickly. But in American use. Uh, Epinephrine. So, is there a difference of these two different drugs? And another question is about the bird and treatment. So, you mentioned about the use uh, step by step, use the uh, uh, guideline to remove the and treatment the uh, uh, <clears throat> bird of rota. Uh, it's possible we can use the STO1 because it's a, a mono over overall system, maybe more support to remove the. Uh, the uh, bird in German. Uh, thanks, thanks for, for your uh, talk. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, great question. Number one, phenylephrine uh, is a pure alpha agonist. Uh, norepinephrine is an alpha beta. Uh, so in somebody that's hypotensive but doesn't have bradycardia, I think a pure alpha agonist should suffice in that situation. Um, also, um, the nurses, it's just easier for them to mix and to prepare. Um, and in the pharmacy, uh, we uncommonly give IV aliquots of uh, norepinephrine. So our um, agent of choice would be phenylephrine or just ephedrine as well. Uh, anesthesiologists use that a lot for patients in the OR to get hypotensive. Um, regarding the second question regarding burn treatment, we don't have experience with your device, uh, but a guideliner, guidezilla are both options as well. So, so some doctors, oh, oh, oh. yeah, I have, uh, for your picture, I think you showed the, uh, the single hand technique. Yes. Was that with the OAS that you showed or was it with the Rota uh, uh, device? Oh, that was just with Orbital. Yeah, it just, yes. it, but they're both, I, had, I use it for both. Okay. Um, again, um, it's a great technique to have, but there's nothing more disconcerting than somebody had pulled the wire out. So I think trying on just a routine case as opposed to a case where it's very needed, but yes. So it works for the orbital as well? Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, what I showed you was a peripheral orbital uh, device, but uh, it can be used for rota as well as coronary OAS. Okay. Yes. So some doctors use uh, aminophilin for prevention of bradycardia during rotabulation. So what is your opinion for uh, use of aminophilin? Um, our use of aminophilin is very uh, limited. Um, there are times where, let's say, it was used uh, for, let's say, uh, angiojet, where somebody got uh, hypotensive, but uh, we typically don't give aminophilin. Let's say 250 mics is a typical dose that we, uh, you would give. Um, but uh, yeah, our, our standard kind of protocol uh, would be nipride, uh, nicardipine. We don't use dotaizem or verapamil, you know, let's say, um, you know, 2.5, uh, but. Um, you know, you want to avoid something that has a bradycardic effects, just a pure uh, vasodilatory, vasodilatory effect. And avoid adenosine because it also has a risk of causing bradycardia as well. Just my question to you. Just in the case uh, about the interruptment of the rotation of the in the case of uh, instant resonances in the, some bending region, do you think uh, your way is also effective? In the case of an instant, and the metal and the metal trap. Yeah. How do you think? <laughs> well, if we look at the mechanism of instant resinosis, it's going to be neo-intimal hyperplasia. There may be some neoatherosclerosis with some degree of calcium, but the majority of the pathophysiolo patho patholo pathology would be intimal formation. And atherectomy uh, does not really have much effect on neo-intimal hyperplasia. It's more on calcium. So we uncommonly if ever, I've never personally used atherectomy, whether it be rotational or rotablator, um, because it's metal on metal. I'd rather treat it with, let's say, laser atherectomy. Now, let's say you're dealing with the under-expanded stent, right? So what are the options? Number one, if you don't have IVL, let's say in Korea, one option is to use laser. Laser oftentimes is ineffective against severe calcium. What you can do is administer contrast that will induce micro explosions uh, and that will help 
expand the scent further, but uh, just because of the tissue that's involved, which is not calcified, we don't use rotational atherectomy. Perhaps it may ablate the stent strut itself, which I don't think is a, is a great option. Okay, thank you very much. So, so I got a question for Professor Akasaka. I think you showed a case where you use the orbital and then a rotor blader. So, so, but we know that the orbital, you know, we can reduce the speed or go higher speed to, to a blade more. Why is it necessary to use the orbit, uh, rot a rotor blader after that? And when, how often do you do that? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the orbital telectomy acts as a uh, skipping loop, right? Therefore, we can use uh, the, the wire bias. Uh, uh, if, the, uh, for example, for LAD, if the calcium is myocardial site, so you try to tension uh, a little bit, pull back the wire, and then you use an orbiter. That might be safe because the, if there are no calcium in the epicardial site, the skipping loop makes some trouble, right? Therefore, uh, so imaging is very important to confirm the wire position and the calcium position. So, so in that case, you don't increase the speed of the orbital? Yeah, only that we have only two speeds. Oh, yes. yeah. So speed. if you lose the low speed and you know that you want to ablate yeah. the uh, outer surface, you don't increase the speed because normally you just up the speed to get a bigger... Yes, uh, uh, and also the, the, the wire position and the, the tension of the wire is very important. Therefore, try to confirm the, the, the uh, effect of the orbital atelectomy. We always do the, the low speed for safety and then confirm the, the results, right? If, if the, the result is uh, similar to our speculation, we try to do the, the higher speed, right? And then if it's not enough, you still use the rotor blader in the, the case that you should? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, there are some complications in that case uh, if we directly to use the, the uh, rotor blader. Because after uh, making a root, right, it's much more safe to make a rotor blader. If there are no root, for the, uh, the uh, uh, rotabulator, uh, there are some risks to make the perforation. That is the reason why I did the, the orbital telectomy first. That might be much more sensitive. We speculated, right? Okasaka okay. sensei, yes. uh, uh, how do you think about uh, imaging guided? So I think uh, uh, diamond back system also may be better to using uh, imaging guided. How do you think? Yes. Uh, yeah, we can. Uh, I'm not sure we can control uh, completely or not. But uh, uh, we try to check, uh, as I told you, the, the position of the wire and the position of the, the uh, calcium. We can speculate how to treat. Right? If the calcium is uh, the epicardial side in an LAD, for example. During push in, uh, we can make an ablation because of the, the, the skipping loop uh, motion of the, uh, the orbital atherectomy. But the uh, rotabulator is sometimes difficult to control completely. It's dependent, only we can use wire, right? A steel wire and uh, the flexible wire. That, that is the only way to control the uh, effect of rotabulator, I think. Uh, no, one more thing about uh, dual imaging. I was so uh -huh. Is it uh, commercially available? Not yet. We can make an, uh, yes, uh, for the research, research work, if you want, for uh, two, three cassette per month, it might be okay. But uh, if uh, we try to make an, uh, yes, commercially available system, we have to make an align, right? That, that is a problem. So uh, the Terumo try to make an effort and uh, we can expect uh, two, three years later, right? Still, it takes uh, two, three years later, yeah, three, two, three years. Dr. Thank, thank you for your wonderful lecture. Uh, uh, actually, in Korea, uh, the, the intravascular retros is not available yet. And so could you share your opinion, that, uh, the, sh the experience of the intravascular imaging uh, pattern of the difference uh, between the retotripsy uh, and the, the, the conventional rotational arthrectomy? Yeah, it, it's a great question. I personally do not have an 
Yes, uh, shockwave IVL because the uh, IVL uh, will be available from next month in Japan, commercially available, right? So uh, I think uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Nakamura may have the, the experience, I'm not sure, but uh, I had an experience uh, in uh, some Asian country, right? So uh, IVL system uh, is, uh, the balloon is very bulky, therefore the, the torturous region, it may be difficult to yes, uh, take uh, the IVL system, but after uh, ablation or region preparation, we can uh, take uh, the IVL catheter. And uh, yeah, IVL catheter is very effective to make a fracture, but I'm not sure uh, the, the, the very uh, eccentric calcium. If the catheter is uh, much more than, and, uh, if the calcium is more than 180 degree, we can use uh, effectively the IVL. And also, after putting a stent and you uh, identify the under expansion, you can use the IVL catheter uh, after putting a stent. And then if you succeed to make a, a fracture, you can expand the stent much more, right? Th that is the one of the way to the advantage of the uh, shockwave compared with other operating system, I think. Actually, I have uh, around 400 uh, case experience of the shockwave with Antonio and the UK guy, and uh, Italy and the UK. And uh, we know that actually, anyway, maybe I think uh, two years later, we will do uh, another discussion before shockwave and after shockwave. This is completely different uh, no devices and also the very promising. Uh, just I say so. Sorry, I'm. Yeah, sorry, I'm from uh, India. I think it was a great presentation. My compliments to all the speakers. They have really elaborated uh, the role of calcification and everything. Particularly, I like the presented by Professor Lee, who mentioned that initially the first slide that he put that uh, once you put a balloon there and once you have a dissection there, doing a rotablation in such a patient is going to be a nightmare with passing the wire across. So that was a very good point which was taken. Now regarding uh, lithotripsy, which uh, Professor Akasa just mentioned, in, in that particular thing, we found it a very effective tool for any medial calcifications, particularly the deep-seated calcifications where uh, a rota may not make uh, much dent. If the vessel is more than 3.5 or 4 millimeter, like a LED, proximal LED, I think there IVL does wonders. And in fact, the only difficult part, as he mentioned, is getting the balloon to reach there. So we often combine the two, maybe start with a rotablation and end up with an IVL there. Of course, the cost implications are huge, but generally for such type of patients, yes, definitely. Uh, and another point I want to make uh, with Professor Lee's presentation is, yes, he's described the technique, the, the fallbacks of all uh, for uh, rotablation very effectively. There was one paper, in fact, what we tend to do is if the lesion is very calcific, very plucky, and if I'm anticipating that there, the burr may stall there, and if it's really a very, uh, uh, you know, sort of a very um, shabby vessel there, in those cases, we do something called as half rota rota rotablation, where we just ablate the proximal part of the plaque and we establish some kind of a place, you know, where my cutting balloon and other hardware can go through. And we finish off with by doing a rotablation halfway and halfway a cutting balloon. So then it becomes a much easier vessel to work with and lesser complications. So uh, time is up. So thank you for uh, excellent uh, lectures and uh, active discussion. It's and actually good comment. <laughs> thank you. To thank all, you. all uh, speakers and uh, panelists and audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you soon.